Lord, you are truly, truly worthy of it all. <clears throat> you are all together lovely. Righteousness, wisdom, 
You are my savior. You are the friend. The redeemer of the church. Lord. We bow before you. Jesus. Yeshua. Yeshua, glorious, 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 glorious. Your name is high and lifted up, highly to be exalted above all things. Yeshua. What can we say? What words are there to speak of who you are? Oh Lord, Lord. Help us to worship you tonight according to the wonders of your person. Help us to see beyond what we have ever seen before, to know higher than we've ever known before, to see your glorious face the mystery of your ways. We are nothing, but you are all things, and you love us. We are your children, and we love you. Thank you. Thank you, Ely. You did good. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> yeah, me too. If he's not here, I want to go home. <laughs>
But he is here. And the light of his glory is here. He started talking to me very early this morning. Continued talking to me throughout the day about what he wanted me to share with you. But I have to admit, it's very hard to get settled into it right now. <laughs> Because it feels like half of me is up there. <clears throat> he is the glory. And this word glory is used to describe God's eternal splendor and majesty. He is glory. He is so majestically beautiful. People get saved and I think we all came into the, to the kingdom with thoughts and understanding of our own making as to what it would mean to be born again. And I think in the beginning for most, things start going almost magically right beautiful, and you think, why did I wait so long? But the Lord doesn't want us ever to stop going higher, wanting more, understanding him better. He never wants that journey to become an apathetic endeavor. He's <laughs> I remember a couple of years ago, I was going to be sharing a prophetic word with those who join us online um, Thursdays and Fridays. And I said to the Lord, I think they want to know about the storm. Is it coming? Is it coming soon? Is it coming down the road a bit? What can I tell them about the storm? And he said to me, I am the storm. And the storm is here. I have a work to do, and I will do it. I will perfect my people, and I will shake the foundations of the wicked. He didn't just speak, though. The fear of God came upon me. I started trembling, shaking in his presence. And I'm thinking, how am I to deliver a terrifying message like this to people who are so faithfully coming and praying, interceding for the nation? But he left. That was it. That was the end of the conversation. He is the storm. And the main purpose of the storm and this is what this message is about tonight. The main purpose of the storm is to divide asunder truth 
from the faults. There is a glory, a glory of man. And there is a glory of the eternal one. Very different. Even sometimes when we have men like John the Baptist who are filled with his glory in ways most could never comprehend. He's out there in the middle of the water, dressed like someone who's never been in public and doesn't know how to dress. We look at him and we think, how could this man be serious? Yet, though his glory on a temporal level, level was very, very low, that which was within him was very, very high. When we learn to discern between the glory of our Father and the glory of man, our walk takes a quantum leap forward. The Lord loves you and he wants very badly to bring you into the beauty of his dwelling place. And he wants to teach you how to walk there. He wants to teach you how to sit there. He wants to teach you how to learn there. He wants to teach you how to rest there. There before his throne, there before his glory, ever changing, ever transforming, you it seems like he's being transformed, but it's really you and me. Our mind is being transformed. Our vision is being transformed. Our heart is being transformed. Our soul is being transformed. Our spirit is being transformed. And what is transpiring? Hunger, hunger for the divine, hunger for the glory of the divine, hunger to know him deeper, greater, broader, a more real picture of him than what we learned in Sunday school. He's so different than we at first thought he was. But this difference magnifies his glory. And he wants to condition us in such a degree that we can bear being in that higher presence. His very word must be adjusted to our growth. If we are young in the Lord, I'm not saying by years, but by experience. He cannot talk to us the way he can if we really have left the world behind. And we have become separated from the world. Then we begin to learn heaven's message. Heaven's understanding. And as Paul said, and I, I love this phrase. I haven't thought about it for a long time. But the wonders of his person. When you really know him, it is impossible to consider not being right next to him every minute. Drinking of the fountain 
of his holiness, of his glory, of his love, of his righteousness, of his majesty. It is impossible to think about that. It's painful to think that you might be separated from the beauty of his person. Whereas, if you have an occasional experience with the Lord, it might be nice for a moment, but then doesn't take long to forget it. And the need to entertain it again doesn't seem to grab your heart as much as it would someone who is accustomed, accustomed to living in that fashion. So the Lord asked me today to try to help you separate the holy from that which is temporal and profane. Now, I'm not talking about going to church versus going to a movie you shouldn't be seeing. That's not what I'm talking about here. There is a majesty. There is a glory. There is I don't know what word to use. When we think of glory, we might think of a picture that you see this light above the Lord's head. But glory, his glory is living. It is who he is. It is what he is. It emanates from him because his, his, his being is so filled with the essence of who he is and all these glorious things that pertain that it shines from him like this most impressive and brilliant light and we think in ourselves well that's just a light but it's not it is him and he wants you to live in that place He wants to bring you real close so that you can't stand to be away from him. This is true, what I'm telling you. This is what he spoke to me about today for you. Many Christians in America think that Christianity is about getting saved, thinking a little differently about life pre-salvation and a life in salvation. Now, where they used to really like to hang around with profane friends, they kind of like the idea of going to church and learning about God and being part of the worship service and so on and so forth. They go to work on Mondays and they kind of want everyone to realize that there's been a little change in their person. They're a little more understanding, they're a little more loving, they're a little more patient. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's Christianity to them. They may even read their Bible a few times a week. And this is Christianity to them, they now like the idea of hearing someone preach the word, where before 
They weren't too keen about it. But that's not how God sees Christianity. When he looks out over his church, he sees souls that need various levels of the light they don't have. He sees hearts that he is imparting and implanting into the desire to know his son and to become made in his image, though they don't at all really understand what that means. He sees a kingdom that is very much unlike the kingdom of heaven, but it's also very much unlike the kingdom of the world. The church, if you will, and that place where the church dwells is like a bridge from earth to heaven. And he spends, if necessary, a lifetime working with us to enable us to make this transition when it's time for us to go home easily and not in a difficult way. But he is the glory. He is the glory of that kingdom. That kingdom is glorious only because it is in him. It constitutes what he is, who he is, and what he wants to do for the creation he made. He is the glory. Heaven is beautiful, I've been there many times, but that is not the glory. He is the glory. We can come to church and experience his presence. And it may seem glorious. But it's not the meeting. It's not the worship. It's not the building. He is the glory. He is the one that's reaching out to us and trying to bring us in to rest in his spirit. Turn, if you will, to Psalm 145. We're going to look at verse 11 down through 13. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. It is amazing to me how some people, I can remember years ago, I was going to be ministering that morning in a, in a church and the pastor said to me, now, I want you to know, I know you talk a lot about intimacy with the Lord. But men have a hard time with that concept. They like to talk about the power of God. So if you could throw a little bit of that in, it might be easier for them to receive they shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. 
to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Do you know that when the children of Israel were down around the bottom of the mountain and the Lord is on top of the mountain, the angels and the fire round about the top of the mountain, that the Spirit of God moved in and took a vast portion of these people into a spiritual experience. I'm talking about on this trip out of Egypt. And they experienced eternity. He took them through all of the generations to come like that, very fast, and took them into the majesty of eternity. There are records of this. So when that experience was over, these people's spirits were so wide open that they had to fill all of this excitement or whatever you'd want to call it that they were calling it was something so what did they turn to? The worship of idols because that's all they knew. But can you imagine being exposed to something like what the Lord gave them and then going beyond the dust to hellfire. It's just incomprehensible, I know. To make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom, they saw it, they saw it. They saw it. To see his kingdom as one thing in a much lesser degree, but to see the glorious majesty of his kingdom, this is so brilliant. It is so holy. It is so far beyond the human reach to be able to endure for even two minutes Unless he gives special ability, special grace to endure. And they saw it. They saw the beauty of God. The beauty of holiness. That's why the Bible is replete with such terminology. They saw it. How do you see something so transformative and ever, ever want to be part of the world again? Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. What a revelation. We're talking back at a time when people, 98% of the world, were worshiping idols. Dead idols. Are you with me? And look what they're writing. He's living, he's life, he's glory, he's majesty, he's eternal. He's wisdom, he is beauty, he is holiness, he is love. 
and he's eternal. What in the world does that mean? But you know, what a place to live. <laughs> Many, we, we could spend five hours here tonight just going through scripture that describes the glory and the majesty of heaven. And that's not really what we're here for. We're here to separate the holy from the profane. We deal, we live in the midst of the profane. You can't turn to the right or to the left without seeing it. It's everywhere. And the spirits that inhabit that airspace are forever pressing on you. Forever pressing on you. Trying to change your thoughts about God. And trying to change your thoughts about yourself. In respect to God. Did you ever stop to think about that? You can wake up in the morning after a glorious time at church the night before and think, I can't believe I'm still here on planet Earth. You may think a lot of things, but probably not about God, about his beauty, about his kindness, his mercy, all the things that we hear about regarding God. Last night you were in the glory, this morning you're in the doldrums. Because it's everywhere and spirits are constantly pressing upon you to influence your mind. Sometimes when you're thinking about yourself and you think, I wish I was different. I just wish I was a different person. That's probably not you thinking. That's probably a spirit trying to get your focus off what is holy, what is beautiful, what is lovely, what is God, and on to yourself in a very negative way. Do you hear what I'm saying? He wants us to learn to understand the difference between the holy and the profane. As a Christian, we don't have to go to the holy. Because the holy one is in us. But we do have to learn to walk with the Holy One. You can stay home and have such a phenomenal time with the Lord if what you're looking for is the Lord. If you're looking for entertainment, you probably won't enjoy it so much. What he wants to do collectively, individually, is cause you to become so jealous for his holiness that you want nothing aside from that. If you touch a thing and you realize it's not holy, you're going to brush it aside because you don't want anything contaminating your heart, your mind, your spirit, your soul. 
He wants you to think every day what is holy, what is temporal, what is profane. Every day. So that when you go out into the world to touch the place you live in, you are in the world, but you're not of it. He wants you to become so self-protective of what he's done in you that even when you're in the world, you are more in God. You may touch it, but you will never let it touch you. Let's look at 1 John 2. Let's start at um, verse 13 of the second chapter of 1 John. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. And this is eternal life. What is eternal life? That we might know him and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Does it mean a casual, oh, Jesus, yes, yes, and I'm sure you know who I am. Nice meeting you. No, this speaks of an intimacy in the Greek. You have known him. Because you have known him intimately, I, John, am writing to you. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Now, there's many levels of overcoming the wicked one. The first level is you get saved. You realize the world is not the place for you. You come to the Lord, you accept him as Lord of your life. You may not totally understand you're going into a new kingdom, but at least you know you're going into a new boss, right? In that first step, you have overcome the wicked one. From that first step, there are constant pulls, constant moves by the Holy Spirit to bring you in, to further you from the wicked one, bring you into greater overcoming of the wicked one and his ways, and greater submission to the Lord and his ways. So for that, he's also writing the young men. And to the children, because ye have known the Father. So clearly this is not for anyone outside the church and it's not even necessarily for everyone in the church. But it's for people who are hungry for more of God. I've written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you young young men because ye are strong in the word of God, abides in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. I love this. He keeps coming back to that issue, doesn't he? Because where he lived, he understood the imperativeness of pulling away from the things of the world, 
and the powers of darkness until you are literally one with the king. And you have overcome all things dark and you live in all things light. Now you may think that's not possible, but it is. Love, this is the first step. Not Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, you could say that to a lot of Christians, and they'd say, oh, I don't love the world. No, I don't. Yet, they're picking up magazines to find out what the latest fashions are. They're buying, you know, recipe books to see what the best um, recipes are. They're maybe reading um, books like, uh, you know, storybooks. I can't think of what they're called right now. That have nothing to do with reality. Maybe they watch things on the internet that have nothing to do with the deeper things of God. They don't love the world, but they can't get out of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? He clearly says to them, nor the things that are in the world. Don't love the world and don't love what the world presents. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And to the degree that you spend all of your time doing all of these many things, the love of the Father stands back waiting. I bought you. I called you to myself. I love you. But I can't reveal myself to someone that is so busy in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, I want to say this very simply. The pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes have already experienced the judgment of God upon them. When Christ died on the cross and was resurrected, the judgment of God fell on these things. And if you continue passionately going after these things, what are you doing? It's like a, please forgive me for this because it sounds kind of gross. But it's like a dog going back to its vomit. If you practice the lust of the flesh, you know that your, your flesh is inflamed by one thing or another, and you keep going and tempting yourself in these things, you are dabbling with what has already been put under the judgment of God. I can remember a time when the enemy came to me, I was still living in Clovis, California at the time. I was in prayer. And he visited me, not the Lord, the enemy. And he tempted me in these three areas. And I just, you know, I didn't know what to say. I was upset. I was furious that he was doing this, to be very honest with you. And I kept saying, no, no, no. Then he shows me the glory of the world. In a split second of time, I was taken across the face of the whole globe to see the glory of 
the world. He said, this I will give to you if you will only bow down and give me one drink offering. That really inflamed me. And I said, I'm not accepting your challenge. Get out of my house. And for three days and three nights, I had a hard time sleeping, but not because I was fearful. I said to the Lord, why did you allow that to happen? That hurts me so bad that you would allow him to challenge me in those things when you know my heart belongs to you. I said it to him dozens of times. Finally, one time I said it, and he said, you know, Nita, he did the same thing to me. So just because you belong to Jesus doesn't mean he's not going to keep trying to get you back. He will challenge you with these temptations over and over and over again. Everything he can possibly use to distract you from the glory of the Holy One. And here we go. We think we're so pure as Christians, and yet we find ourselves constantly being pulled back to these things that are under God's judgment. Isn't that a scary thought? Under God's judgment. But that's where we sit. That's where we stand. That's where we walk. Every day of our lives. Our thoughts run constantly in step with, can you say it? No one can say it with the world. I'll say it for you. And how is this? Because we spend so much time looking through their media. However we do it, radio, television, the internet. You know, it's like what computer specialists developed a phrase to say, Decades ago, garbage in, garbage out. You take the garbage in, when you need holy, all you're going to get is garbage. The world, listen, the world passes away. And who goes with it? Those who love it. You belong to him. That's why he's asking me to talk to you about this. You belong to him. And he loves you. He desires you. He desires you with such a passion. A passion that is so enormous and so intense. That he found himself giving his only son. On the cross. To have you. He loves you. He loves you passionately. Some might say, well, yeah, but you know, I'm not really a great, great Christian. I'm just kind of a, maybe a little better than the average, but I, and he's saying, no, not so. It's not about that. It's about you are mine. You 
are mine. I bought you with a price, and I love you with all I am. I've never regretted not one minute the price that I and my son had to pay to have you. You can be the most perfect, you can be the most imperfect Christian, but I love you. But those that love the world will pass with it. Do you believe what the Bible says? We can't like, you know, sneak around hoping to avoid this issue. What we set our hearts on has already set its hearts on you. There was a time Satan really didn't care if he had you or not. But the minute you got saved, he suddenly became jealous for your affection. And you're the only one that can say no. Let's look at Galatians 5. Let's see how we can identify the world a little bit better. 10, 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the work of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, verse 19, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Boy, oh boy, this is overwhelming, isn't it? Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Now, I have, because of the kind of warfare our ministry does, I have found myself in the presence of a spirit that is called the spirit of the world. And if you ever find yourself in the presence of that thing, this is his personality. Everything I just read to you. Now there are obviously spirits of idolatry, spirits of lasciviousness, and so on and so forth. But the head guy has all of this as part of him. And you can feel it when you're in his presence. Do you know what else you feel? Hatred for all things righteous. When I feel this, I have to rebuke him immediately. Because, you know, it's a reminder, this is not fun and games. He's serious. And he's got to know how serious I am. Are you guys okay? You think you can survive all this? Christ has conquered the world the spirit of the world, and all things therein. He has conquered them. And he has conquered in you the sinful nature. 
That is the nature that came into Adam when he sinned. He has conquered that thing. Yet, if you are still given into the world, still giving to the love of the things in the world, you are thriving and causing to thrive the sinful nature, which Christ has already conquered. You don't have to live subjected to and submitted to the spirit of the world. You don't have to live subjected to and submitted to the sinful nature. Are you with me? You don't have to. Most people, even good Christians, do not know that. Christ has already condemned these things and he has already conquered them for us. So when we are tempted, we're tempted away from the holy, tempted into the profane, what happens to your glorious spirit? Every time you subject your glorious spirit to darkness, darkness takes a greater hold. You might say, you mean even as a Christian? Yes. The only way to live a life victorious over these things is to determine in your heart, I'm going to find my way out and I'm getting out. And God will show you the way. The Bible, you might say, is the Magna Carta of the divine will for the church. If you want to know what God is like, what he will tolerate, what he won't tolerate, what it means to be in the world, what it means to be in the holy of holies with God, the holy kingdom of God, what it means to actually become a holy kingdom in God. The Bible is the answer. You read the Bible not just to read it. You listen to teachers and preachers not just to listen to the gospel. Are you with me? but you do so to learn how to overcome what Christ gave you the victory to overcome so that you can become made into his image. That is why you're still here. He could have saved you and whipped you away to heaven. Just like that. That then the whole purpose of saving you on this earth would have been lost. He wants to strengthen you in righteousness. He wants to give you an opportunity to look at the profane next to the holy every day you're alive. So you can get stronger and stronger and stronger in Christ. He wants to take you home, not as a babe in Christ. If that's what it works out to be, that, that's what it works out to be. But that's not what he wants. He wants to take you home strong. Strong in righteousness, pure in holiness, magnifying his son. He wants to make you part of a bride that is without spot or wrinkle. 
glorious bride to enter into a glorious kingdom. That's what he wants. And it's really not a mean endeavor. In all the years that I have walked with the Lord, these words have led my path. Be ye holy, for he is holy. Every decision I would be called to make, I would have to say, is this going to result in a greater holiness? Or am I going to get off track here? And if I don't get greater holiness, I fear getting off track. I don't want to go through those decisions. By doing this, I came to love holiness more than I love to breathe. To this very day, if someone were to say to me, so where would you like to be most with the Lord while you're here on this earth? I would say, in his holiness. Manifested holiness. Because it is so pure, it is so clean, it is so lovely. And there's really nothing that depicts his nature more beautifully than his holiness. God is looking for a glorious bride. She's beautiful. I've seen her through his eyes. She's beautiful. Do you know why? Because she's holy. She's beautiful because she has been made righteous. She's not just beautiful, she's majestically beautiful. A bride fit for the Son of God. The day is going to come when the earth is going to see her the way she really is. Will you be part of that company? What will you do to ensure that? If you will make that commitment And if you will pull yourself away from the devil's temptations, I promise you, you will find standing there waiting for you, the Son of God, waiting to make you his bride. Don't sit here and say, well, I, I became his bride the day I got saved. Wrong. You became engaged to him. But you don't become his bride until you enter union. It's just like temporal marriage. You are engaged to him, and to him, that means you're his bride. But the efficacy of what happens when you actually enter into union and all of that begins to be poured in you and through you is as different as night and day. Maybe you were engaged to your husband for two years before you got married. 
but you never knew how gloriously wonderful it could really be until you got married. And it's like that with Christ. He holds us, he loves us, he treats us with tender care. He's intimately involved in everything about our lives, in engagement. But there must be union for the bride. People, I've heard Christians ask this question many times, I'm sure you have too. Is there really, you know, like a, what do they call it? You know, like a special little group. I can't remember what, what, the, what the word is. Pardon me? Not a click. Um, pardon me? Remnant. remnant. Is there really a remnant? Yes. It's his bride. It is those who have paid the price to really, truly leave the world and enter into union in this life. When you go to heaven, that will be an automatic exchange. But he wants you to do it here. Does it make your walk different? Oh boy. Yes. And it is glorious. The Bible says to kiss the sun. That's union. Paul uses that terminology constantly in his writings because he made union. But my dear, dear friends, my sisters and brothers, my family, not many make union this side of heaven. Do you know why? Two reasons. Number one, they love their self-righteousness too much to let it go. They never want to be corrected. They never want to be told they need to change this or change that, to let go of this, run away from that. They don't want to be corrected. They just want to love Jesus. And they do love him, wonderfully love him, just not enough to die. So self-righteousness. The second reason is because making union is not easy. It's doable. Anyone can do it. I don't care if you're a child or if you've been saved for 50 years. And you suddenly realize you can have this extra step in the Lord here. Most don't want to pay the price. I would say 95%. And what does the Lord do about that? He says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I bought you, I want you in heaven. But if you don't want to pay the price for union here, I'm not going to reject you. But for those who will, you thought getting saved was amazing? You thought receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit was amazing? Nothing compared to union. Can I, can I show you just one more thing? I know it's getting late. Turn with me, please, to Galatians. 
chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. Up here in verse 17 or 19. Have crucified that. Those that are in Christ have crucified the flesh with the the affections and the lust. If we live in the spirit, let us Walk in the Spirit. What does it mean walking with Jesus in union? His character, his nature, the sinful nature has been eradicated. That has to happen before union. Your soul is purged, 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 purged. Many times by light. So that he can heal all the wounds from the life of sin. So he can translate your soul into a kingdom Christian. And then he takes up residence and you become one with him. Who do you become one with? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Do you think that's not going to be different than living as a Christian without him inside? In a state of union? Could you imagine... Having intimacy with him? We're going to see more people enter into this grace in this time than has ever graced the church. But it doesn't matter whether it's at a time like this or if it was 50 years ago. There's still a price to pay. You have to die that he might live in you to the fullness. You guys don't look happy. (laughs) Does it just feel too serious? It is pretty serious, but I want you to know it's also pretty wonderful. Pretty wonderful. People want to know, well, how do you get Jesus to visit you? (laughs) Chase after him. How do you get... More than a few visits to heaven. Chase after Jesus. He's the king. He'll give you whatever you need to better understand him and experience him. This is a joyous thing. Serious, yes. But joyous. Okay, Lord. It's your turn. You pick the heart. You pick the heart of the willing one. You pull the threads of the heart. 
You give light and enlightenment that will help them see and understand. Draw them with cords of love. Draw them with a hunger for your holiness, a hunger for the sun. Oh, Lord Jesus, I feel the fire of your spirit around my heart. Let your fire come upon the hearts of these people, Lord. Call them. Yeshua, call them. Let your very words become fire upon their hearts, Lord. Call them to the greater. Call them to the higher. Call them to places that only angels walk. Lead them in the valleys. Carry them to the mountains. Oh, Lord, let them have a hunger for truth more than they want to breathe. There is nothing, nothing in this life if we live not for truth. Oh, Lord, help them see that it's not about us in this life. It is about you. I'm trembling by your spirit, Lord. May they tremble at the sound of your word, at the sound of your truth. Oh, God, lift them out of the apathetic, the comfort zones that they've hidden in, Lord. And let them see your face in glory. of Judah how glorious you are the lamb calls but the lion leads because the high places are fearful without you My heart hurts with ancient longing for your church. Yeshua, may your glorious heart be satisfied with these people. Let your own hunger consume them. Yahweh, your love is so real, so pure, so powerful, so living. Transformative. It can change the whole man, the whole woman. It can change them into something they never dreamed possible. Oh, Lord! Let it be, let it be, let it be. Please 
please come up come up to the altars and pour your hearts out to God don't go back to your seat until he says I will claim you we know not who we are Lord we know not what we are all we know is we are yours. Give us your love for your truth. Give us your passion. Oh Lord, your passion for this glorious dwelling place, Lord. looking for the humble of heart, Lord. The seeker of your mysterious glory. Open the portal in their heart, Lord, to begin to drink of this fountain. Holy God, glorious King. Majestic King. Fill us, fill us with your passion, Lord. Fill us with your passion to come into the flames and become one with you.
as a deer panteth for the water brook. So my soul longeth after thee. For I have lived in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. But here I am, Lord, hungry, thirsty for you. I leave the desert behind and I come to your waters, oh God. And I will saturate my soul with the waters of your love. Your face is so beautiful, Lord so tender, so kind. Your yearning is so pure, so blessed, Lord. You roam through the night looking for that one who awaits your arrival. Come with me. Come with me, my bride. My loving one, come with me. Follow me to the heights of the mountains. Apples of gold is your wisdom, Lord. You take us to places we have not known before. A wisdom that is too high for us. And there you cause us to eat from your hand. We love you, Yeshua. We love you passionately. Give us grace to live nobly before you, expressly before you, in the beauties of holiness, Yeshua. Lord, you know every heart, every heart that is in this room. And those who truly long for your holiness, I ask that you will touch their hearts and begin a process of preparing them for this wonderful, wonderful grace you give. We open our hearts to you, Lord, now, and we invite you to come.
Lord, there are those here tonight that need emotional healing. And I pray that you will flag their hearts and begin that work tonight. That they may have faith that you desire them and that they can please you in this walk even if they make mistakes. Do this for them, Lord. Lord, there is such a need in the hearts of these people to hunger for truth, pure truth. Not just a liking of it, Lord, but a hunger, an insatiable hunger for pure truth. Baptize them in this, Lord. Baptize them. Fill their innermost being with a hunger for pure truth. Tonight, if you need healing in your bodies, please come up here and I'm going to ask some people to come and pray for you. Just come up here and stand.